Hello and welcome to the lesson on graphics and charts in nonfiction. The Pennsylvania standard that we're looking at today is analyze and evaluate how graphics and charts clarify, simplify, and organize complex informational text. So let's get right to it. Think about the big question here. Why do we need to be able to understand all of the extras on the page? And what are some of those extras on the page? Well, hopefully by the end of class, you'll be able to answer why we need to be able to. Here are some of the extras that we're going to be looking at. We're going to be looking at visuals, which means pictures, drawings, diagrams, etc., graphs, charts, and timelines. Okay, so jumping right in, let's start with visuals. Visuals can help you understand on a deeper level. And what does exactly that mean? So let's let's go back to an example. Do you remember when we were talking about theme and topic? And I talked about Degas. Degas likes to paint dancers, especially ba ballerinas. So thinking about this, do any of these pictures on the page look like a Degas? Think about that. Yes, no. Okay, if you said no, you're on the right track. Now, how do you know? Ask yourself. These are Degas' works. How many of you remember these from our theme versus topic lesson? If you remember, you're probably a visual learner. These probably look much more familiar to you, and you're saying, oh, yeah, I remember these. That's because 65% of all people are visual learners. Even if you're not a visual learner, everybody is a little bit mixed, so there's a part of you that probably remembers those pictures and are saying, oh yeah, I, I, I think they look vaguely familiar. Those are Degas' works that you showed us. And so the point here is that for all of those visual learners, adding pictures can really help to build concrete understandings for those people. Even if you're not a visual learner, those graphics can help to clarify and give deeper detail to the ideas in a piece. So let's look at all of these pictures again. Think about how the two sets of pictures differ. Recognizing those differences shows that you can discern the smaller details you are clarifying in your own mind. So when I showed you back in the beginning, whoa, where'd it go? <laughs> so when I showed you these and asked you if they were Degas, you look, probably looked at all these pretty pictures, looked at the texture on, it looks like maybe bricks or stones here, this very vividly contrasting black and white, and told yourself, mm, they don't look quite right, but why not? It's those details in the picture that you didn't remember. Look at the details in here, and we even talked about these a little bit, the, the idea that all of these are young girls and fluffy white tutus. We had that instance of the windows and the tall doors in every single one of his paintings. These are all common themes that run through Degas' works. And if you recognize these as Degas, but you recognize that these were not, then it's those smaller details that you discern, yes, you did it, you are capable, and you guys have solidified in your own mind by using these visuals. This is why we use visuals, especially in nonfiction texts, where the author is trying to get you to understand something on a deeper level. So let's look at an actual piece of reading. Let's look back at our novel that we've been looking at since we started our nonfiction journey here. I'm going to read a passage, and I want you to try to picture what's going on here. Okay, and then we're going to go back and we're going to add in the graphic and see if that helps you. Far above on A-deck, second-class passenger Lawrence Beasley noticed a curious thing. As he started below to check his cabin, he felt certain the stairs weren't quite right. They seemed level, and yet his feet didn't fall where they should. Somehow they strayed forward off balance, as though the steps were tilted down toward the bow. Major Poochin noticed it, too. As he stood with Mr. Hayes at the forward end of A-deck, looking down at the steerage passengers playing soccer with the loose ice, he sensed a, sensed a very slight tilt in the deck. Why, she is listing, he cried to Hayes. She should not do that. The water is perfectly calm and the boat has stopped. Oh, I don't know, Mr. Hayes replied placidly. You cannot sink this boat. Others also felt the downward slant, but it seemed tactless to mention the matter. In boiler room number five, fireman Barrett decided to say nothing to the engineers working on the pumps. Far above in the A-deck foyer, Colonel Gracie and Clinch Smith had the same reaction. On the bridge, the commutator showed the Titanic slightly down at the head and listing five degrees to starboard. Nearby, Captain Andrews and Captain Smith, or Andrews and Captain Smith did some fast figuring. Water in the forepeak, number one hold, number two hold, number three hold, the mailroom, 
Boiler room number six, boiler room number five, water 14 feet above key level in the first 10 minutes. Put together, the facts showed a 300 foot gash with the first five compartments hopelessly flooded. What did this mean? Andrews quietly explained. The Titanic could float with any two of her 16 watertight compartments flooded. She could float with any three of her first five compartments floated. She could even float with all of her first four compartments gone. But no matter how they sliced it, she could not float with all of her first five compartments full. The bulkhead between the fifth and sixth compartments went only as high as E-deck. If the first five compartments were flooded, the bow would sink so low that water in the fifth compartment must overflow into the sixth. When this was full, it would overflow into the seventh, and so on. It was a mathematical certainty, pure and simple there was no way out and of course this is from Walter Lords a night to remember so who can picture what all of this means are you an A I can a B maybe a C not so sure a D what did that just mean or C E I am so confused if you're confused that's okay I would expect it that's what we have graphics for so listen again to the part about all of the different pieces of the ship. Watch the graphic. Really pay attention, and I'll try to point it out down here, too. Nearby, Andrews and Captain Smith did some fast figuring. Water in the forepeak. Okay, so here we have the bow of the ship, which is the front end of the ship. Here's the forepeak. Number one hold. Number two hold. Number three hold, the mail room. Boiler room number six. Boiler room number five had water 14 feet above keel level in the first 10 minutes. Okay, here's the water line right here. So the keel level in number five is right about here. And within the first five, 10 minutes, the water was already up to here. Okay, what did this mean? Andrews quietly explained. The Titanic could float with any two of her 16 watertight compartments flooded. Okay, and although we don't see the whole ship here, we could see probably, let's see, 5, 10, we could see 14 of those compartments. Okay, any, any two of them flooded, she'd be fine. She could float with any three of her first five compartments flooded. Any three. So she could even float with all of her first four compartments gone. That would be these right here. But no matter how they sliced it, she could not float with all of her first five compartments flooded. So, and we had water in all of these, and then we had the water all the way up to the sixth one. And as they, they went on to say, the bulkhead only went up to E deck. So what that means is once the water is here in 10 minutes, once the water gets up to here, it's going to spill over here, and then it'll just keep spilling over, fill up, spill over as the boat sinks. So no matter how they sliced it, she could not float with all of her first five compartments full. Did that make it clear? Hopefully it did, and now you can really understand the power of graphics in a nonfiction piece, especially if there's a lot of information. It's really really good to try to find a graphic if you're reading a piece and there are no graphics you guys are the digi digital natives go look for it Con you know consult the Google gods see what you can find to help yourselves along okay we're gonna turn hopefully that's all clear now everybody got that that piece of the Titanic and why it actually sunk let's look at other types of graphics in today's world, being able to read a graph or chart is key to finding lots of information fast. Okay, We know that a lot of people, especially younger people, don't like to read those details. They'd rather look at the graphs and charts and, and pictograms and all the different types of graphics that are out there. So in this way, you guys are actually you're uh, better at this sometimes than even some adults that are out there because you guys have been seeing these since you were really young and this wasn't popular to teach in education so you guys have the advantage here let's just look at a few make sure everybody's on board let's look at this one this is sometimes called a circle chart I like to call it a pie chart because you guys know I love food type of graphic pie chart on cookies so take a look at this what can you learn from this chart this one's on Girl Scout cookies. And first look, you're probably thinking, oh, it's talking about different kinds of Girl Scouts cookies sold this year, right? And looking, you're thinking, oh, yeah, Thin Mints were the top. And then the second one is Samoas, and then Tagalongs, and then do -si dos Trefoils, and then those others are probably all the other kind of cookies that they have, you know, pilot programs with all over the country. 
And it looks here that, that these are pretty close, 56 to 39, so there's not a big difference, maybe about two-thirds, it's most about two-thirds the size of Thin Mints, right? But you need to read very carefully. Look at this. It's not actually cookies sold. This is KCAL sold per year. What on earth does that mean? So this is where sometimes you really need to do a little investigating. Make sure you're reading your text that goes along with it very carefully. Because if you just look at your graphics, it seems to say that we're, we sold about two-thirds as many Thin Mints or Samoas as Thin Mints. It's a little misleading. Let me show you why. KCALs, by the way, refer to a thousand calories. But if you look at the cookies themselves, and you know I have them here, I looked it up, Thin Mints are 40 calories per cookie, whereas Samoas are 70 calories per cookie. So when you break that down and actually calculate this out, what that means in sales is that Thin Mints sold 1.4 billion cookies and Samoas 570 million cookies. Hmm. Sounds like still big numbers, but what does that look like if we actually put it back into their own pie chart? Look at this. We sold pretty much three times more Thin Mints than Samoas if you're looking at actual cookies. Look at the difference. Look how misleading this can be. Okay, so if we turn these numbers back into pie charts, sales in KCALs, sales in cookies, Look how close they look in here, the Thin Mints and those Samoas. But when you just take them out, isolate them, and turn them into actual cookies instead of calories, it gives you a much different picture of how many cookies are sold. This is why you need to be very, very careful and make sure you're reading all the details in your charts. The moral of the story, be sure to read charts and graphs carefully so that you will fully understand what information you are being given. Okay, so let's look at this one, type of line graph. Of course, I'm using cookies. We'll stay on the th same topic here. We're looking at Thin Mints, sales of Thin Mints, weekend one, weekend two, and weekend three. Think about what you can learn from this graph. We have Thin Mints start way up here. Obviously, we sell more Thin Mints than the other two new cookies this year, the Ra Ra Raisins or the Toffee Tastics. But look, the Ra Ra's took off till the at the end. They actually outsold. What kind of conclusions can you make based on that? Maybe that Ravros got popular. People tried them in the first couple of weeks. People started talking about them. And at, by the third weekend, the Ravros were even more popular than the Thin Mints. Toffee Tastics, on the other hand, they didn't do so well. We have to ask ourselves why. Hmm. Here's another one. This is a bar graph. This, again, is all about weekend sales for Girl Scout cookies. Weekend one, weekend two, weekend three. All the different kind of uh, cookies are there for you to see, eight different kinds. Think about what conclusions you can come to about this graph. I'm not going to let you sit on this too long because we're actually going to do this one when we come back to class. Just remember, there are many, many different types of graphs. You have line graphs, you have bar graphs, you can have uh, web graphs, you can have horizontal bars, there's a, the vertical, there's horizontal, you might have dot plotted graphs, you pie charts again, there are fabulous Venn diagrams, and again, this is kind of a diagram or a map. There are also many different kinds of charts. Look, you've got, this one has a key. And you can see when you're really looking at comparing lots and lots of information, spreadsheets are great for using to kind of calculate and compare things. All different kinds of charts. Last type of charts we have are also flow charts. Family trees are flow charts. Here's one. Find your yoga. What kind of yoga do you like? And of course, we have the March Madness taking us all the way into the final four for basketball. These are all different types of flow charts, ways of organizing information. The last one are timelines. Timelines are crucial when reading about history, science, discoveries, and many pieces of historical literature. They can help you clarify and understand the progress of important events, inventions, and even people's lives. Bookmark them when you can. That way, when you get to those different parts of the story in your nonfiction piece that you're reading, you can refer back to these and say, oh yeah, okay, I see it. I visually understand it better. The most important tip about graphs and charts, of course, is do not ignore them, okay? When texts refer to them, see, it might say see chart one, figure 12, etc. take a few minutes to really look at it and understand what it is sharing with you. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions, be sure to ask your teacher. That is what we do.